Good evening and aloha everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday. It's Tuesday, meaning it's time for Tuning Up with Iggy and Dave, presented by your Hawaii Symphony Orchestra in this beautiful Hawaii Theater Center. Um, Dave, how are you? Why, I was just wondering before the show, why are you red shoes? Uh, I've moved on to black shoes this evening. It was maybe pointed out by someone that I was wearing the red shoes just a little bit too much, and so I've diversified my wardrobe. So did you have actually time to step out of the office to go shopping for black shoes? You know, I had a pair of brown shoes that were the exact same, and I found them in black, and it was a very simple process, and uh, you know, we, we moved on. But speaking of wardrobe, can I, can I ask you a question, Nikki? Yes, please. You are, you are wearing the official HSO shirt, thanks to our friends at Kahala, which means you must have done something with an instrument in your hand today. I did. Uh, did we, am I allowed to talk about this or just a little bit of a... You can tease. A tease. Yeah, so uh, I was uh, very lucky to uh, have come to the Hawaii Theater a little bit earlier than usual today, so we could do some snapshots and some video shots and audio shots of uh, some uh, wonderful, surprising gift uh, that will appear later this month, Dave? Yeah, April 29th uh, at a very special event for uh, someone very near and dear to us. Uh, but it brings us to the very important person in the middle here this evening. Iggy, can you please introduce <laughs> our guest? Well, we are so happy and privileged to welcome guitarist extraordinaire, Jeff Peterson. Thanks, Jeff, yeah, you? great to see you guys. Thanks for having me here. It's been a Pleasure. really fun day. It's, it was a very fun day. Amazing and, day. Uh, I don't actually remember the last time I saw you in the flesh. Uh, was it perhaps the last time you performed with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra? It may have been since then, yeah. That was a couple of years ago. Yes, yeah, so wonderful yeah. experience, we'll get to it. Dave, was today the first time you actually got to meet Jeff? It is. I've heard a lot about Jeff. I've heard him perform, uh, but there was such a crowd around him after he finished that evening that I couldn't make it to him uh, to introduce myself. So I was thrilled. I think the next day I picked up the phone and I called Jeff. I said, hey, we got a little project mm -hmm. that I really uh, could use your help in. And Jeff hopped on and said, I'd love to be involved. And uh, hopefully uh, the cornerstone of uh, the next projects that come down the line here for us. It was wonderful yeah. to meet you and hear you play this afternoon. Thank you. So, yeah. yeah, and I'm sure a lot of uh, viewers will have questions for Jeff, Dave. Yes, uh, you can text us your questions this evening uh, to the number here below on the screen. Uh, we will answer those uh, questions for Jeff, especially questions for Iggy. Um, <laughs> Why especially? <laughs> well, and I suppose questions for me as well. Um, we are a few weeks away from performances. However, due to the nature of the uh, ever-changing circumstances here with uh, the much needed restrictions in place. We are not yet ready to announce that, so please don't ask me any questions about the performances, um, but I promise we have an announcement coming. We're very close. Very soon. So Jeff, um, one of the segments we talk about, or we call is, uh, is called To Dave with Aloha, and last week our special guest, Monica Chung um, from Koi, uh, suggested a few things that um, Dave should discover. So to Dave with Aloha means anything that we should suggest to Dave that he should discover about our beautiful alignments. Great, and yeah. I know that you actually grew up on Maui. So what would you tell Dave, hey Dave, you should go to Maui to fill in the blanks? Sure, sure. So first of all, welcome to Hawaii and thank, thank you, you for what you're doing for the orchestra. It's so exciting. And I, I've been hearing uh, about what's happening. I know you'll be sharing with the viewers soon. And just everyone tuned in, look out. There's a great season coming up and wonderful events happening with the orchestra. And isn't the orchestra just, it's such an essential part of the community here in Hawaii. And to have some, a resource like Dave here uh, doing what he's doing for all of us is a real blessing. And he's been here for a little over a year now. He told me he hasn't left the island. He's been here on Oahu. And so you got to start island hopping I a do. little bit. I so do. if you make that trip to Maui, uh, I grew up up in a town called Makawao. And what you don't see on Oahu are these big 
sloping mountains like you see on Hawaii Island and uh, you'll see Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea and Haleakala on the island of Maui. So making that trip up to the very top of Haleakala is one of the most breathtaking views you'll ever see. There's this enormous crater and as a child, my dad was a rancher, so we used to ride horseback into the crater really? all the way across, and we'd, we'd stay at some of the cabins there. And it's one of the most unique places on Earth. And the fact that it's here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, yeah. you can get up at 10,000 foot elevation and then get down inside this crater. It's amazing. Wonderful. Well, I look forward to our, our trip to Maui here, I hope very soon, uh, with the announcement today that it's a little easier for us to travel there into our islands yeah. come uh, middle of May. Uh, I, I think we might be a little busy middle of May with some other activities. Well, but, uh, I, the musicians will take care of it. We'll just oh. play and you can go to Maui. Is that how this? Okay, great. Nice. <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> you heard it here. It's just a half an hour flight. Yeah, you absolutely. Right over. Yeah, you can do it in a yeah. day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Actually, Jeff, um, my wife's uh, dad is from uh, Maui. Um, and he grew up not too far from where you grew up, uh, but more like on, on the Kula main highway, I guess. Sure. Upper Kula. Upper Kula, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's about the same elevation yeah. as Makawao, just right across the mountain. Yeah, it, and so I grew up above Makawao. There's Olinda Road that keeps winding way up, way up there. I used to get uh, rides to Makawao School when I was in elementary school in a pineapple bus. That was our school bus. And where I lived, they'd pick up kids from our neighborhood right about maybe a third of the way up Olinda Road. It'd only be 10 minutes down to get to school, but we'd have to go all the way to the very top of the road, then all the way around Piiholo Road. So it'd take about an hour. <laughs> so, and then the opposite, going back home from school, the long ways. And uh, the bus driver was actually a, a farmer who moved from Japan, and he thought everyone was wrong for driving on the side of the road that they do here in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd be honking at people and screaming at them. Fortunately, there's no traffic up on that road, so we're safe most of the time. <laughs> and I remember driving there once and getting completely lost. I was trying to make my way to Kahului uh, from my uh, father-in-law's um, Dad's place. Oh, one wrong was, turn, yeah, and you're way across the other was, side of the mountain. And it was before <laughs> the times of, of GPS. So. Right, right. And things like that. I wanted to ask you, um, you, you said your, your dad is a rancher. Yeah. Uh, what is the, can you educate us a little bit about what a paniolo is? And yeah, this, sure. The, uh, uh, a cowboy from the, the Hawaiian Islands? Yeah, so the, the paniolo tradition comes from the word española, and the vaqueros were brought in in the 1830s in Hawaii Island, where there was a wild herd of cattle, and Kamehameha the Great had placed a kapu on the cattle, and it was his grandson, Kamehameha III, who brought in the vaqueros to take care of the, these wild bulls that were just storming across the island. So they needed to have uh, these, these vaquero come in and start a tradition that became a real important part of the culture. And the music that I grew up listening to came right out of that tradition of slack key guitar, Hawaiian music, coming from first in Waimea on Hawaii Island. The first cattle was brought into Kona side, but then quickly it spread out towards Waimea, and now we're Parker Ranches. That's considered the birthplace of slack key guitar and a lot of great Hawaiian music. So that comes from the, the cowboy tradition all the way back to the 1830s. So from cowboy tradition to Grammy Award winner, is that, is that true? Is that our quiz question this evening, even, <laughs> Iggy? Yeah, so why don't we uh, get to that quiz question yeah. so we can get it out sure. of the way first. Sure, yeah. yeah. So, Jeff, we'll let you ask that yes. quiz question. So, yeah, and what does the winner of this quiz question get before we Well, go? Iggy, what is the bottle of wine that we have this evening? <laughs> so, I, I can't really see that far with my eyes, but it's an organic wine. Oh, thank you very much, Donard. It is a Fleury Roche Guillon, Domaine du Phare, 2016. Um, in other words, it's a Beaujolais. So, um, and we've actually uh, had a, because we were here earlier today, we had the opportunity to, 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 to savor it. And uh, we all approved. Yes. We did. <laughs> Thoroughly. Yes. And also, I'm going to add into this. So as you're enjoying your wonderful wine, I have a brand new CD that was just released a few weeks ago. It's called Mele Nahe Nahe. It's all music that I composed 
over the past year, and it's all nahe nahe, soothing, healing. So it's solo slack key guitar music. And uh, so I have the CD here. You can check it out. And this is going to be uh, for the, the winner to enjoy with a bottle of wine. You can have some nice nahe nahe, paniolo style Hawaiian slack key guitar music. So the question is, I've been featured uh, on Grammy Award winning recordings. How many have I been featured on? In, in uh, Grammy Award winning CDs. Yes. Yeah. Um, soothing and Healing, uh, we won't even get to um, uh, um, the beginning, but the question I have for you is, before I even hear your guitar playing, and I hear your voice, and I find it very soothing and healing. Um, is that something you always had from a young age? Because you always seem very cool and collected, and, and just to hear you talk, it's, it, it, it's very, very some, very, something very soothing about it. Uh, were you told that uh, other than myself? Or? Sure, sure, yeah, I, I think it's probably from where I came from, growing, growing up on Maui. And, being coming from a beautiful place, uh, yeah, it just it's just in the blood. And but you've been in many places, and, and uh, sometimes when you live in, on the, I, know, I understand you were living uh, uh, around LA. Um, right, right. None of all these uh, um, noises affected <laughs> you. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it did, definitely. And I actually, it was so exciting growing up on Maui. And then going off to college, I went to USC to study music there. And I couldn't find many teachers. Not many of the, the Paniolo had time for teaching. You know, when I was growing up, I mainly learned by ear and just learned you know, how to read and play classical music and other pop music and Hawaiian music, just listening to recordings when I was growing up. And so to finally be able to go to a great school and be surrounded by amazing teachers and musicians and then getting to just venture all over LA, which is a huge sprawling city, but getting to hear a lot of wonderful music that really opened my ears. And so I, yeah, I definitely, I brought all that back home. But I mean, so you learned by yourself or, I mean, how did you, you first learned slacky guitar or? or yeah, I learned my dad play? played uh, and he sang Hawaiian music uh, and he played very basic guitar, but he could accompany himself when he would sing. He was more of a singer. And I immediately got really taken by just the guitar itself. And how old were you? Uh, I was probably about seven or eight. And then I owned my first guitar when I was about 10. And then I really got into it. And yeah, I just listened to different recordings. So my grandfather, uh, who was a doctor here on Oahu, uh, he loved Dixieland and swing. So he was trying to convince me, no, don't listen to you know, rock and roll and blues and pop. No, you got to listen to the. And he thought that jazz ended after Dixieland. That was it. <laughs> I, like once bebop happened, it was like too much, I guess. But so he would uh, give me all these early recordings to listen to. But then on um, the uh, other side of my family, that and my grandparents were really into classical music. And uh, actually my uh, mother's mother was an incredible artist, a watercolor artist, and both of her parents were classical musicians, a pianist and a violinist who played with symphonies. And so, I was introduced to all this different music, Hawaiian music from my dad, jazz music from one grandfather, classical music from my grandmother. Then, uh, like most kids, I was listening to all the guitar heroes of, of the time, like Eddie Van Halen and uh -huh. Steve Ray Vaughan. And so I just wanted to soak it all in. And I think what my music is now is just a culmination of all that. But when I went to college, I really focused on classical music and jazz. And Hawaiian was always something, it's, you know, traditionally, you just learn it by ear. So, wait, first of all, I just wanted to ask you, because I'm sorry, I don't know, but is slat key referred to, to Hawaiian music? Yeah, it's a type of guitar playing here, and basically what happened is the vaqueros brought guitars in, and they played in a, a style that would be, I would imagine, similar to mariachi music coming from what at the time was Mexico. And so the Spanish tuning was used. There's certain styles like fast waltzes. That's a big part of that tradition. And there are a few Hawaiian songs that have survived that have 
that connection to the mariachi sound. Yeah. Uh, slack key is, literally means to loosen the tuning key. So it's a regular guitar, but what happened here in Hawaii that's very unique is that because maybe the, the uh, musicians who were given guitars and started playing weren't really taught much about playing. So just using their ear, they changed the tunings. And now there is this huge repertoire and range of sound you can get with many variations on the tunings. And they're very personal. A lot of the tunings were like uh, family secrets and not, not really openly shared. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they're very, very unique and, and special. And that defines <coughs> the sound as the tunings. The history of the guitar here in Hawaii goes back to a, another guest that we had a few weeks ago. We had uh, uh, Brian Clark uh, from the uh, Royal Hawaiian Band. And nice. we were talking before the show about kind of the history of the guitar and the influence that it had during the, its time at the Royal Hawaiian Band, that there's actually a, a type of guitar that kind of came out of this. Amazing, amazing story and connection that the second director of the Royal Hawaiian Band, Mekia Alakai, he was a protege of Henry Berger. Henry Berger was a protege of Strauss. He was brought in from Germany during the Hawaiian monarchy years by Kalakaua and then under Lilio Kalani. He was a, a music mentor and composer, but he started the Royal Hawaiian Band. Mekia Alakai took over. He loved the sound of the guitar but it just wasn't loud enough. Mm. So he actually was able to approach Martin Guitars and designed a guitar that was actually in production and commercially available uh, in the, I would say, like early 1900s. And um, it was called the Mekia Kealakai model, and it was a large size acoustic guitar that could project sound with the Royal Hawaiian Band. And so they've actually taken that model, and it became the Dreadnought style of Martin, which is the most famous acoustic guitar. And so that came directly from a Hawaiian artist. Yeah, wonderful. They don't still have, we'll have to ask Clark, they don't still have guitars in the band, or do they? Uh, not so much, no. Not so yeah, much, yeah. okay. So yeah. in high school, did you actually play in a band by yourself with singers, or? Yeah, yeah, I played, there was a stage band. I played in that in high school. Then I had many bands, and at that time, I was into like instrumental rock guitar when I was in high school, like most kids. <laughs> so you grew out of that. I grew out of okay. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was, yeah, I was. I played uh, with with different bands back home and things. But at the same time, I was I was so immersed in music. So I was learning. Uh, I was listening to Segovia and mm -hmm. studying uh, a lot of the the music of all. The, like a, a classical violinist, there's a there's more structure. A lot of guitar music, because the guitar is such a popular instrument in other styles of music, I found that it took a little bit more direction and not having like a Suzuki method or something like that for guitar. Um, I just did a lot of listening and then I found, wait a minute, there were some methods. The Carcassi, Matteo Carcassi was a great 19th century um, guitarist and uh, writer, Fernando Sor, Francisco Tarega. Mm -hmm. Then I started getting into that music and through listening to Segovia, I got more uh, influenced by the range of sound than all the great composers that were inspired when Segovia brought the guitar to concert halls. Uh, Taroba and uh, Castanuevo Nuevo Tedesco so. and uh, Villalobos and all these great composers started writing for guitar. And so I started researching that repertoire as well. Maybe Augustin Barrios? Maybe? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I mentioned Augustin Barrios because I think really he's a composer from Paraguay. And um, I really loved his, uh, I really loved his music. And, and actually, when when uh, Chris, my wife, and I got married, um, uh, we were uh, looking for music. And for the processional, um, I really wanted that piece by Augustin Barrios. And and so I asked you, Jeff, yeah. if you'd be so kind to play for our wedding. And, and you did. And it was yeah, really it's so beautiful. I remember that. Incredible. Was, was so you. Um, you self-taught, listening to all these um, recordings and finding the methods. Is that how you got ready for your audition when you wanted to uh, major in music? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so while you just uh, you had all that repertoire in your hands when you were looking for what the requirements was for USC. Yeah, and I, I had fortunately I met a guitarist from Oahu who had studied with Pepe Romero. 
and also studied with Peter Moon. So she had this really beautiful balance between what I was interested in, Hawaiian music and classical music, Lisa Smith. And so she did a recital on Maui. It was just one of the, actually, the UH Outreach College okay. programs. They do the library programs. This one is Wailuku Public Library. And I was so fortunate that I got to hear her play flamenco and classical mm. music and then do slack key in ways that I hadn't heard it done before. And so I asked her where she went to school after okay. that concert. And that because she said USC and mentioned Pepe Romero, that became my focus. And uh, she didn't tell me what requirements were, but I knew it had to be really good. So I just, after hearing her play, so I just focused and practiced. And I fortunately I had, because my family was knowledgeable about good music, I had access to get the music. And I just had to be disciplined long before YouTube and you can actually see people play. I just right. had to use my ear and what I could learn on my own. So when I did make it to college, I had a lot of uh, things to, I had a good head start, but I had to relearn a lot with technique and things like that. So from USC, you came back to Hawaii as planned. Uh, what, what, was, what led you to come back to Hawaii here? Yeah, well, I was in uh, deep, deep into uh, music school, and my third year I had an injury because I was playing so much, and I was studying jazz and classical music and what they called studio guitar in L.A. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And starting to get into that scene a little bit, starting to do recordings and working with all these groups. Yeah. And after being, you know, from the slopes of Maui with not a whole lot of action going on, I was just, I dove in and I just overdid it. So I had to take about a year and a half off from playing. And in that time I came back, I decided, well, I could just sit around and hang out or I could, you know, continue my education. So I came back to UH in Manoa and I got a business degree. Yeah. What was it like going from that intensity of playing and uh, learning to having to be removed from your instrument for a and, year? And can you tell us what kind of injury you suffered? Sure, it was just, it was basically like related to carpal tunnel. It was something related to what they call thoracic outlet. It was a nerve uh, related thing from just bad posture, you know, doing this so much instead of opening the shoulders. And so I would get uh, just really strong pain going down my arms, both arms and numbness. And there's a, there's a nerve, yeah, tingling. There's a nerve called the ulnar nerve. It's the strangest thing. Your pinky can be entirely numb and then half of the ring finger, the, the half that's near the pinky, that would be numb, but the other side would have sensation. So that was a, a sign that this particular nerve was being pinched. And so uh, in a way, actually, I'm, I'm very fortunate that instead of, if I always imagine, well, if I stayed in LA, I probably would have gone in a totally different direction. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I could connect more with my heritage and uh, Hawaiian music and be here in Hawaii, I'm really glad, actually. Yeah. So in a way, it was a blessing. Yeah. And then not playing your instrument for an entire year. How did, what was that like? I mean, we've, got, we've gone through this 13 months of, of right. really, you know, so many musicians, you know, being removed from an audience, but still having the ability to, you know, have the, uh, you know, the context to continue playing. But for your instance, what was that, what was that like? Was that a relief or was it the opposite? I actually, I tried to make the best of it. And yeah. so I, I did, I studied composition. I studied orchestration. Okay. I, I, I was able to yeah, write you music. Or... Uh, yeah. And then uh, I did a whole semester at USC without playing. Oh, so I, okay. I, I hung in there for a semester and I had to do all of that. That was frustrating because I was ready to do recitals and, mm -hmm. you know, and I was in all these bands and, all, and getting calls to do things. And, uh, but I did, it really, I think as a composer, it really helped me. So I, I tried to not just turn off music entirely. But then at the same time, when I came back home, I had a lot more time. You know, I spent most of my high school years just focused deeply. I mean, you were probably the same. The, the amount of commitment it takes to be really devoted to music, it's just a lifestyle, right? So suddenly I had a little bit of a break from that. But did you think that you Okay, so you earned your business degree, but did you think that, okay, it'll get better and I'll get back to music? Or did yeah. you think like, I have to do this business degree because I don't know what's gonna happen? 
it, yeah, it was to have something to fall back on. But I also thought like most musicians need to be small business owners in a way, right? And having some sense of what I was doing business-wise would probably be a good idea. And immediately I could tell like in these, the way that often the classes were, they're all talking about big corporate. It was nothing to do. I wanted to know about small business in Hawaii. And I, I did get some exposure to that, but a lot of it was, you know, studying business law and accounting and uh, <laughs> you know, finance and uh, statistics. I called it sadistics. <laughs> Some of these painful classes. But it was, in a way, I think I took the discipline that I have from the devotion to music and focus and, and practice. That really helped me. I could handle reading about all these, you know, uh, the math involved in, in finance or uh, the, the long case after case study of business law and all these things. And so in a way it was refreshing uh, just to have a change of perspective, but also just being at UH, living on Oahu was exciting. And uh, you know, so I felt fortunate to be here. So how long did it take between the time when you had to quit playing the guitar until mm, things started to get better? And so you felt like you could safely come back to it? It took about two years, and I, I think that the reason it took so long is I think immediately uh, a good friend of mine at USC had a family friend who was one of the top hand surgeons in California. And I think going to a hand surgeon instead of a physical therapist uh -huh. was a, not a good move uh, because immediately he was just looking at my hands Surgery. and wanting to cut it open and I was like, why on earth would I want to do that? Because that could permanently change how your hands work. And so it took me a long time to find what I needed to focus on. And once I did, I was able to recover really quickly. And I had the, the feeling all along that I'm young. This shouldn't be, you know, life changing. I should be able to get around this. So what helped? Therapy? Or? Uh, th a lot of physical therapy exercise, but also evaluating how I was playing and my, my playing posture and um, how I was just really studying every muscle and, and joint in the hands and how, how to balance and let go of, of energy and isolate the fingers and you know a lot of very, very repetitive focused slow practice of changing technique. How much do you think about that now? Oh, I still think about so, it all, a yeah, lot. Yeah, definitely. How much See, I'm you... sitting up more straight. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as we all adjust ourselves. Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Iggy, how much time do you spend on the, the mechanics? Well, I never quite thought about it when I was younger because unlike Jeff, I didn't have a problem. But I have been thinking about it more lately because um, since I'm on the wrong end of my century, I mean, you know, the, um, um, so you, 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 your joints or your muscles or your nerves are getting older. So I've had to uh, take care of some things. And like, like you said, um, sometimes you, you go see a hand surgeon, but uh, they're more like, you know, fighter jet pilots. Mm. And they want to get right to it. And, and for us musicians, at least, at first, it may not be the best idea. So, um, but I have to be careful, you know, the thumb, you know, because um, uh, what do you call it, osteoarthritis or whatever, osteoarthritis. Um, if I move it the wrong way, or if I force, or if I tighten up, and the worst thing you can do, is kind of self-prescribe yourself your own therapy, which I did. You know, I went on on the, my search engine and I, I looked at videos and. Oh, I should try this and that and this, and that was the, exactly the, the 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 worst thing because it just exacerbated everything. So, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, this at this um, uh, a time of my life, it's something I have to be very aware of. Um, and like you said, Jeff, I think sometimes if something hurts right here, well, the uh, the cause may be right there, right? So, yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, yeah. You, it's um, so holistic approach that you have to have um, to those. Uh, I think, Dave, you, you don't have any pains, do you? <laughs> <laughs> None whatsoever. <laughs> I think a good takeaway from the whole thing is that a lot of times there's a, 
uh, feeling like, oh, something's wrong with me. I have to take a pill or I have to yeah. have a doctor fix it. A lot of things we can fix ourselves. Yeah. And it's just a matter of knowing what the right steps to take are. A lot of people, it's diet, it's exercise, it's right. not being stressed, sleep, sleeping enough, right? And it's, it's hard to pull all those things off all the time. It's a challenge. Yeah, I think it, if you know your body, then, then, then it helps. But it's hard to know your own body sometimes. I have practiced now for like five hours and I don't feel any pain at all. It's, it's completely fine. It's because it's a different, even when I'm practicing, I'm constantly thinking about relaxation and uh, taking the, it's not constant use of the hands. It's, you're turning it on and off and isolating muscles, all these things. There's a way that you can do it and have more control. It's like that, uh, I think when I was younger and, and playing and, and practicing and spending all those hours, it was this like no pain, no gain right. mentality. Right. Yeah. And that was just exactly. the complete opposite. Um, playing the viola is supposed to be easy. The more relaxed you are, the, the better you sound. Um, at least that's you know where I got to. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting here. So what were, you, what were you listening to? So you go through this year, you're in business school. Yep. What so were you the listening greatest to? thing about UH that I learned the most from, I, I definitely learned a lot and I have my own record label now and I've been running my own business for over 20 years. Yeah. And that helped me, definitely. Yeah. But there is an audio visual library the Sinclair Library. Uh -huh. I yeah. probably use that library Top more floor. than yep, more than any other person. Even when I started teaching, after I, I got hired to teach, uh, run the guitar program. After I was better in playing, and yeah. shortly after, you know, getting my business degree, and they had out of print Hawaiian recordings. Yeah. They had this treasure trove of the history of music here in yeah. Hawaii. But at the same time, they had incredible classical collection and jazz. I immersed myself in listening to that music. I started transcribing slack key because I had heard it growing up and I played it, but no one taught it. And I know that Keola Beamer, who I'm a, a huge, uh, really admire his work, and a lot of my heroes that I became much more familiar with at that time, I've gotten to work with and, yeah. and meet, and we're like family now. But Keola was the very first to write down uh, slack key music and publish a book. So I started transcribing, and since that time, I've been writing down the tradition, taking my classical background, yeah. and trying to, you know, this folk music, and trying to write it out in the different tunings. And I have now an archive of maybe about 500 pieces that I've written out. Just so it took, it took me 20 years yeah. to do. So that process started then. So I was definitely not giving up on music. I was just going at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. Wow, wonderful. Yeah. I'd I've been hearing all the wonderful things that are in that collection, the old Hawaii calls, yeah. uh, archives, yes. and, and those types of And of a lot things. of uh, lectures that were given at UH. Really? That are, yeah, that those are all documented there. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, I had, I spent more time there than I did in, in the class. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, when, when you were at USC, did your teachers want you to narrow your your style or your genre or to start focusing on, on a particular either classical or rock or because or, you know ever since the beginning you always have many uh, a wide variety of, of styles. Right. Well I think the the program that I went to was called Studio Jazz and so right away the, <laughs> the emphasis is being able to go into a studio and play any style of music and that was in right at the tail end of basically the studio scene being what it was in LA because now everyone with a home studio and a computer you don't have to be in that in Hollywood to do that recording anymore but a lot of the teachers were a big part of that circuit and so you'd go into a session and you'd be playing on someone's album and they'd want you to have a particular sound that diversity was actually an asset and so I, pr I spent most of my time studying classical music because that took the most amount of discipline, technically. But at the same time, I was studying jazz harmony and, and theory and phrasing. And then there is, there's like a Delta Blues class that, that we had. And the, there are all these different styles. And it, that was actually just actually encouraged. But I think one thing that led to my injury was the fact that I was trying to take on so many different so things. and with jazz, the emphasis isn't as much on technique as it is on, is on creativity. 
and uh, understanding of the language of that music. So imagine if West Montgomery went into a teacher and the teacher said, you can't use your thumb to do that. He's this amazing guitar player, redefines okay. jazz, only playing with his thumb. If a teacher said, no, you have to use the other fingers or you have to use a pick, he wouldn't have sounded the way he did. So in, with that tradition, there's less emphasis on a particular playing style, as long as the music is coming across. The teachers weren't worried about the technique. Now, we're talking about creativity. Um, I wanted to ask you, as uh, they're, I think they're resurfacing the asphalt on the road right now. <laughs> yeah, the something so, like that. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if you're hearing that or the siren. But speaking of creativity, so you have all those styles in your hand. But what about the actual composition of, of creating? Where did that come from? Because now you're creating original songs and, and, and so forth. Uh, did you always have that? or? Did your, your semester at USC studying orchestration and, and, and other courses help with that? Or what, when did that spruce up? I think because I was mainly self-taught, uh, I had to always try to be creative in different ways. So I started writing as, as soon as I could start to play. I was starting to write chord progressions and, and, and songs. So I think I've always just naturally been inclined to try that. But definitely when I, uh, when I first started playing without teachers or like a lot of structure, I was like a parrot. I could hear things and play exactly what I was hearing, but n have no idea what it was. So I became a much more accomplished composer, I think, is when I then understood why music works and, you know, more about theory. And so definitely the time that I had at USC really helped shape my writing, for sure. Can we, I want to ask a few very specific things about guitar technique. I'm not someone who has ever probably picked up a guitar. I think I picked up an ukulele in a hotel room once. Um, that was, my wife will probably tell you that it was a prop or like a decoration. I wasn't supposed to touch it. So that gives you my context. Talk about picking it for me. What, what does this hand do? You know, we all see the guitar picks, but no one really uses those. You don't use those. What goes on in this right, hand? Right. It depends on the style that you <laughs> yes. play. So uh, classical tradition is a finger style tradition okay. where you're using independently, using your thumb, index, middle, ring finger. Not so much the pinky. The okay. pinky's used for strumming sometimes and, okay. and extending out. But uh, basically, like you'd play on a piano and you can have two separate voices, because the guitar is a polyphonic instrument, you can have bass accompaniment melody yep. happening at the same time. So having the independence of the thumb from the rest of the fingers helps to create that, like the left and right hand on a piano. And on a guitar, you're just trying to squish it into a much smaller space. Right. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, but that's the essential technique is that the right hand is, they call it finger style. You're playing individually playing notes or playing chords with the, the fingers of the right hand, but strumming, that leads itself to why you'd want to use a pick, okay. is there's more of a technique of playing chords with quick strums with either the index finger. Flamenco uses rasciado technique, which means back the nail, and you're doing this extending out of the fingers. But if you do that uh, a lot, and if you play a steel string guitar, an electric guitar, it's going to really beat up your fingers. Mm. So then the pick uh, was added in so that you get more volume and uh, less kind of intensity in the hand. Okay. You've answered so many questions but, for me. Right but like, <laughs> I, I, you know those guitar heroes where like someone would like a pick and they go right, right, exactly. They're That's, just using a pick. Yeah, but they're, so if you think of electric guitar, it's very typical to use a pick, but a lot of the great Jeff Beck is one of those guitar heroes. He played with the fingers, Mark Knopfler. They like the feel of the strings right. and the, the, the nuance of that. Uh, a lot of Hawaiian musicians, like Ledward Ka'apana is a, a great slack key guitarist, he uses finger picks. So you can still do the finger picking, but they put these metal picks attached to the mm -hmm. fingers. And uh, Ledward just uses old Hawaiian style, just two fingers. If you've had poi here in Hawaii, you know you can have the one finger poi, two finger poi, three. <laughs> Same with guitar playing. Okay. <laughs> you can use different fingers. Gotcha. And so a lot of the traditional old style of slack key playing just uses thumb and index finger. Okay. But still doing the finger picking, yeah. but they also use picks to have a louder volume. So okay. picks will give you, uh, definitely make the sound carry more and give you more uh, louder sound. So it's more in, in English style 
you know, uh, hill bow versus a French oh, uh, picot, right. Right. That's right? Right, I, right, right. Yes. <laughs> Jeff, I don't know if you remember, but I actually took a lesson once. From right, you. right, really, yeah, right. because there was a. You were you're very you were learning classical in Paganini. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Some of the the, the the duets he wrote some guitar music. Yeah, yes. So so Paganini was you know, um, yeah. That's why I think he when he would, would compose uh, the accompaniment would think in terms of a guitar player. Yes. And, and he did write some sonatas for violin and guitar. But, um, but I, in France, a lot of kids, um, well, kids and older, um, love this movie called Jeux Interdits, Forbidden mm. Games, which has to do Romanza, with... Romanza, uh, the, the Romanza. Yes. Which has to do with uh, uh, World War II and, and, and some kids whose parents died during the war. And the, the soundtrack is this uh, anonymous romance, right? And so I wanted to learn that on the guitar. And so I got a guitar, I was trying, but I wanted, I wanted to get a sound, but without having long nails. Right. Uh, so I, I, I called up Jeff, and Jeff was kind enough to, to give me a lesson. But um, I, I don't that. think that's I ever got Manoa, it. In Manoa, when I was living in Manoa. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it just, it just, you know, the tone in music is so important. And hmm. I think when you're a beginner on the, on the piano, that may somewhat seem easier. Because you immediately hit the key and you get a note. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's, the guitar mm -hmm. is much guitar. more detailed because both hands have to be coordinated. And uh, the way that you get the volume with finger styles, you use fingernails, right? So if you're not using nails, it's going to be a warm sound, but a, a softer sound. Okay. And there's a typical difference. Uh, I have students who play violin and guitar. Typically, the, the violin left hand is leaning back a little further, and so the, it's a transition trying to get the left hand more right. around and parallel to the neck. So it's easier to reach because the fingerboard is wider, right? But we cheat and use frets. It's like, you know, <laughs> we're totally spoiled. <laughs> How was Iggy as a student? Well, oh, great, we had so much fun. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I remember you picked it up, right? I mean, his right. musicality is like yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, unbelievable. I'm just so, curious. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> How are we doing on the quiz question, Dave? <laughs> we, we don't, I don't think we've seen any responses yet. Um, uh, hold, hold on a sec. I'm getting a few as we well, speak here. Well, well, while Dave is looking at, at, at his phone, Tell us about the latest CD that you've... Uh... Yeah, so the, this latest CD uh, is, over the past year, I've written about 100 songs, about more than 100 songs, because every Wednesday, I do a program on a website called Stage It, stageit.com. So tomorrow at 2 p.m., I'm doing music of the Hawaiian Renaissance. Uh, and then Thursday, I'm playing with Henry Capono. So I'm going to play some CNK songs tomorrow. And so we're playing at the Blue Note in Waikiki. Uh, but from that... Uh, it's got me inspired doing these different programs each week to write music. And so the new CD has pieces that were some of those pieces that I composed over the past year. And they're about different places in Hawaii, different people. I couldn't travel like everyone. I was at home. So my way of traveling was writing music about the people and places that I was thinking about. And so I did research on Nalani Eha and the royal family and their music. And each sort of decade all the way up to the present of music in Hawaii and like the swing era's influence and hapahaoli music. And then uh, even before that, some of the influence from coming from Henry Berger from Germany and waltzes in Hawaii and all, the, all this different history that I discovered, the history of the steel guitar and where that traveled around the US and the world. And so just music started coming out of that. So the CD is called Mele Nahe Nahe. I'll hold it up again if anyone wants to check it out. You can find, I, this, I have, uh, I decided to print a CD. Everything is online. You can, of course, go to Spotify or any sort of digital platform, Pandora. And you can find the music there. But if you want to get the CD, my website is jeffpetersonguitar.com. It's available there. And so I had a lot of fun working on the music. I recorded it at home, but had it mastered by a great engineer in LA who I've worked with on a number of different albums. So it was fun to be able to uh, record at home and then be able to send it off to this amazing mastering engineer on the mainland. Did you feel that uh, during the pandemic, your, your, your creative process uh, was even higher debit than, than on the pre-pandemic? I think because I was doing these shows, and I've done 55 stage consecutive Wednesdays, and every week I've tried to do a different program. So I'm trying not to repeat songs that much, 
that's a lot of work. It is. And so because of that, that inspired me to write. And because I didn't have to go catch a plane somewhere and be traveling, I had this time, it helped me just, that was my way of finding peace with all the, the things that were going on and having a creative outlet. And I really enjoyed it. So yeah, I got into, I think when you're learning anything or you start committing to it, once you open your mind to it and like, okay, I'm going to start writing. And sometimes, you know, creatively, things might not come right away. But once you get into a routine of doing it, ideas start flowing and then it becomes a really natural process. And I really tried to Mainly, this, this album features a lot of uh, the slack key music that I wrote, but I try to find new tunings and new sounds and have connections to some of the programs that I was doing. And you mentioned Herring Capono again. It's Thursday at the Blue Note. Yep, so I'm actually doing a live performance with other musicians. I'm very excited about that. So we had a rehearsal yesterday. It was great fun. And uh, yeah, Henry Capono has an artist to artist series at the Blue Note. He's been doing it for the past couple of months. And so this will be the last program in that. It's streaming if anyone wants to watch the show from home. Or you can actually come in person and hear the music at uh, Blue Note. I think it's 6 p.m. on Thursday. So I have, my show tomorrow is at 2 p.m. Every Wednesday at 2 p.m. on stageit.com. You can go to my website, too, jeffpetersonguitar.com, and there's an events page. Uh, and then Blue Note is the the night after that, Thursday. And so you've, you've worked a lot with singers, uh, Henry Capono, Amy Hanai Aliwa. Yeah, um, Amy Hanai Lee, uh, Nathan Aviao, I perform with him often. Is it, how different is it to just play as a guitar solo and, and to work with singers? I love working with, with singers because, especially singers like Henry Capono, thinking of songwriting, he's written some songs that just are such a strong part of our culture here in Hawaii. They, they define so many people grew up with that music, and it's, it's so close to so many people's hearts. So to actually be sitting with Henry, and he's the humblest, most amazing, laid-back person, and just come purely from the soul, just be feeling him sing, like right there, sitting right next to you there. I can't tell you how exciting it is. And he's an incredible musician, and there's still new things he's discovering about songs that he's written. So just working on, like, how are we going to play this different? You know, we're, we're arranging some of the songs he's played for many years, but trying to look at them from different angles and uh, really inspiring. So speaking of working with phenomenal musicians, I understand that you have performed with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. I have. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I wrote a concerto. Uh, it premiered. It was actually commissioned by a former member of the symphony who became a very dear friend, Peter Askin. He's now the music director and uh, main conducting teacher and new music curator at North Carolina State University. Yeah. And for their new music program, he asked me to write a piece. He just got in touch with me and it's like, oh, Jeff, you could write a concerto. Come on, go for it. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so a year later of like real focused writing every day, I actually, I, I wanted to try to take on this, the biggest hurdle I've ever mm -hmm. put out in front of myself. And I, so I wrote a concerto. And uh, my, my dream when I wrote this was to perform it here. Yeah. And so I'm so grateful to the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra for allowing me to have that experience and to be able to play it at Blaisdell. And it was definitely a dream come true. It, it was, I felt so good playing there. I didn't know, am I gonna just panic and you know, <laughs> I felt so relaxed and comfortable, and the, I, it, it was a very powerful experience. Can you talk a little bit about the experience of sitting on stage with 64 plus uh, musicians behind you, uh, soloing with the orchestra versus, say, uh, sharing a stage with Amy? You know, what's the difference? <laughs> yeah, the, the amount of, of energy and the, especially the caliber of musicianship of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra is just indescribable it's a, it's an emotion I, I can't even talk about it. I just but just it feel it was was so inspiring but at the same time knowing Iggy and having a friendship with him I've known yeah. him and respected him for so many years I felt like oh I'm home you mm -hmm. know I, these are my friends that I'm performing yeah. with and you know many other friends in the orchestra that made it feel like much more special to me it wasn't just another performance and the musicians weren't just there just doing what they do. they're they're into the music. Yeah. I, I was feeling that, that in, it meant something to be able to 
play, perform with so many amazing musicians, but have it done here with this connection to home. Yeah. And that was Carl St. Clair that Carl con Sinclair conducted that? Conduct and yeah. What's it like handing your score to a conductor like Carl? <laughs> he was so inspiring. And just the fact that he would sit there and he could sing every line perfectly in tune and all, every solo and immediately had such insightful ideas about interpretation mm -hmm. of the music that it just really elevated things. And it was, it was, there were such subtle changes, but they really meant a lot and they made a really big difference. Yeah. So we spent two hours together and I, I was just floating in the clouds the whole time. It was so great. I'll never forget that experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, um, it's a treat because sometimes we do have conductors who uh, don't spend too much time with uh, the concerto and with the soloist. Right. But, uh, yeah, he was willing to take that time. Yeah, and, and like you said, you have many friends in the, uh, in the symphony. You've, you've done some recordings uh, and CDs with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Nancy Choupeau. Yes. Uh, she's always uh, talking about you. Um, one um, question I had for you, uh, the, the title of the concerto was Malama Aina. Malama Aina, and it was composed thinking of the centennial celebration of the national parks in the United States. We have three volcanoes in the, the national park system. We have Haleakala, we have Kilauea, and Mauna Loa. And so each of the three movements were dedicated to one of the, the mountains. And so I actually traveled to each place to compose. I got that into it. I had to be there and write. So I took my guitar and I took you know, my, my staff paper and by hand, not even my computer, I wrote it out by hand. I just went up to Kilauea and started writing. It was really amazing. There's this amazing drive that's a little bit Malka uh, towards the mountain in between Kilauea and this 10 mile drive that takes you up to the beginning of the slopes of Mauna Loa going up. And there's this amazing canopy of koa trees. And so I wrote the theme for the second movement, hearing the native birds singing and being in that place. So we call it uh, Melipana, or songs of place here in Hawaii. So I thought it was important to actually try that, to actually get on a plane and go to the place and write there. Beautiful. We may have a winner. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they work for the HSO. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure if that counts, but um, what is the correct answer? And I, I think we have a little bit of TV magic uh, as well. I think we might have a clip from 2010, perhaps. Oh, cool. Uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, <laughs> buckle your seatbelt. What is the correct answer? Two. I've been two. two. Yeah, two projects that have won a Grammy Award. But four-ish, depending on the producer awards for the other. <laughs> right, right, right. It's a, it's a, they're producer awards. They're compilation albums. Yes. So they're both for slack key guitar compilation okay. albums. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And then I've had uh, two of my own uh, solo projects that were nominated, one yeah. called Maui in My Mind, and one was a collaboration actually with uh, a bunch of uh, other slack key artists, but all as a, a group recording together yeah. instead of a compilation. Sure, wonderful. Well, congrats on that. Donard, what do, do we have this? Is this a uh, possibility? Oh yeah, this is, this is a performance at the Grammy Museum. Or actually right across the street from here, the, the State Foundation. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> we need a play-by-play. -play I know, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, that was Iggy, a C sing chord. along. That was, there was a B flat. <laughs> <laughs> There's a Hawaiian, that's a Hawaiian vamp right there. Okay, all right. No, but this, they had this beautiful Live from the Lawn series that right down the street at the State Foundation Museum, right across the street from the State Capitol building. Yeah. There, there were these wonderful events there that would happen first Friday of every month, and they tied that in uh, right before a group of us went up to be at the Grammy Awards. Uh, the same show, Sunny Lim from Hawaii Island was there, Amy Hanai Lee, um, I'm trying to remember which other artists were there. I think Daniel Ho was here from the mainland that year. Um, Ledward Ka'apana and Mike Ka'ava performed. And a really fun event, just a packed lawn, everyone out on this beautiful evening. You could see the stars up above and you could see the Iolani Palace across the street. 
And uh, since then, there's actually, there's been a, um, at the Grammy Museum, right by Staples Center in LA, mm -hmm. there's been an exhibit of the history of Slack Key and music in Waikiki. And so I've been up to perform at that a number of times. And it's a, it's a great museum they have up there. Jeff, you mentioned um, flying to the volcanoes to find inspiration. Uh, just from a purely technical standpoint, as a violinist, if I were to think of a melody, I would just think of the melody and play it. But as a guitar player, do you actually think of the chords, the chord pro progression, or the melody, and then you'll worry about the chords later? Or? Well, what was so exciting about this project, I was trying to think in a completely new way because I was thinking of an orchestra. orchestra. And I, th I think of the guitar actually often as a mini orchestra. And like I mentioned, how the right hand, you're trying to do all these different parts. So I, I definitely think of the separation of voices. And I like to think of like, OK, this is the string section. And these are the, the brass. And you know, I try to actually think of that in my playing. But to actually then have that full range of the orchestra and do the opposite of take what's on the guitar and actually fill it out through the whole orchestra. So when I was writing with this particular piece, I was thinking much more about voicings and balance and range and what instrument would carry what idea. So I was definitely thinking of harmony, uh, but I was also thinking more about structure. The first movement I tried to actually loosely base on studying uh, the different concerto forms and actually uh, thinking of, the, there was a particular basic structure, uh, sonata sort of form of the A section, then there's a B section, then there's development, and then a recapitulation. I had a, a concept and even where the, the uh, modulations would happen. And I actually tried to study that and map it out a little bit, but then do it with the language of slack key. The second movement, I definitely felt the mana of uh, the, the volcano, which hadn't erupted yet like it had recently in, in 2018. This is about 2016 when I was doing this. But you could still feel that you could see Hali ma'u ma'u caldera, you could see the steam coming up into the air. So I thought of oli and uh, the oli that would be written for Pele and that area. And so the, that's, the second movement was based on oli and some of the harmony that would be associated with that. But then I tried to push it into some new places, you know, developing the themes. And I definitely thought of um, the way that there, there was the, I could hear the, the sound of an eevee bird, which mm. I'd always wanted to hear. And I actually saw some of the native birds when I was hiking up there. And so I wrote a very complex flute part for, for that second movement that was uh, thinking of what was fun. I could think in many different levels, and it can all fit together with a full orchestra. I didn't have to try to squeeze it onto the guitar. So there's a very active flute part, but then there's a cello part that carries the oli. Uh, and then the guitar part uh, dances around all of that, and like like the mist that comes in. You know, I was thinking of definitely thinking of textures and visual. I also I think a lot about visuals when I'm composing. Oh, that's wonderful. We tend to think of you know just a solo guitar player or just like strumming, and there's so much knowledge and creativity uh, with you, Jeff. Yeah, uh, well, we might need to pull that one that performance out of the archives for one of our HPR yes. broadcasts Absolutely. at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was broadcast that. once. It uh, was, so, so yeah. We'll have to do it again, we, yeah, sure. we have the opportunity to, to, to do some rebroadcasts on occasion, so we'll have to right. prioritize that. But as we get to the end of our time here this evening, we have to thank uh, Hasser Wines this evening for... Uh, the wine and the charcuterie board. Uh, we're, we're grateful to Terry and Mike down the street here from the Hawaii Theater Center uh, for their support. We encourage you to go down and support them. I popped over this afternoon to pick up a few bottles myself and to show our support for our, our local business here who continue to support the symphony. So thank you, uh, Terry and Mike and uh, everyone at Hosser. So uh, the winner this evening uh, is a gentleman by the name of Steve. Uh, Steve had the correct answer of uh, two, uh, and so Steve, we have a, a bottle of wine. I think it'll be easy for me to get it to you. Um, uh, we'll just have to see your ID to make sure you're over the age of 21, uh, and a CD <laughs> nice. as well. Yeah, so, you know, usually we toss this question at the very end, um, 
and but you already sort of talked about it at the in the middle of the show here. What does the future look like for the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, classical music, the collaborations? What what vision do you have for the the future of music here in Hawaii? Well, I think that the the symphony is such an important part of our community, and I know that there will be a way always to find ways to keep it going and. I really am excited about the potential for collaborations with local artists. I love the programming choices that have been made already with this. And you know, just talking to you earlier today yeah. about some of your vision, I think the future looks really great. It's bright, it's beautiful. And uh, I'm really excited to see things opening up. Yes. And you know, the fans being able to get out there and experience the music. And there's nothing better than that sensation of seeing the orchestra perform. Yeah. It's just, you know, we're, we're so blessed to have that. So it's going to keep going. Wonderful. Well, we appreciate that, and we look forward to our future work together for the community here, and we want to thank all of you for joining us uh, here Tuesday uh, for tuning up. We've got another show next Tuesday. We're not quite at 55 weeks in a row uh, <laughs> as Jeff is on his performances. So we've got a few to catch up on. Yeah, so we'll be back here next week. Uh, thank you so much for your support. Thank you again, Jeff, for joining us. You, and and cheers you. to you all. You, Appreciate it.